and not death, and about what we do just to give you an idea of how we're trying to use, um, we're trying to look at immune systems of, of non-vertebrate and non-insect phyla um, um, by using simple kind of larval systems um, so that we can look at immune, immunity in, the, in an organism, in an intact organism, without the complexity of, of an adult. So this thing has a, does this have a laser on it? Eh, it doesn't matter. There's no fishing pole here or something? <laughs> so, there is? Okay. <laughs> so, so, we work on this purple sea urchin in my lab, which is in Toronto now. What? Sure, might as well. Somebody in my lab shot some one of my other lab members in the eye with a laser last week at lab meeting. It was great. <laughs> so, so we work with this purple sea urchin, and, and kind of our point of view can in part be explained by where I've been in the last twenty years or whatever. No, yeah, twenty years. So, um, so I kind of started out here, and it did look like that, right? It looked like a military base at the time, and and worked on zooplankton. Um, ecology with Tom Hopkins and me and Ernst spent a lot of time counting zooplankton and then went over to work with Gary Littman on the evolution of the vertebrate immune system. So I worked on chondrichthian fishes mostly. And um, so I worked on, 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 on immunity in the vertebrates and, and mainly adaptive immunity in the vertebrates. And then went for a postdoc at Caltech to work with Eric Davidson and there worked on, um, on um, on gene regulatory networks that, that controlled development. So it was really developmental biology. But that, that really had a lot to do with how we were going to interpret how the immune system has evolved and how it works and how it's similar between different phyla of organisms. And so then now I've, I've gone to, uh, to the Sunnybrook Research Institute at the University of Toronto up in, in Toronto. And so I'm kind of putting all these things together, looking at zooplankton and immunity and gene regulatory networks. And so I was reading the newspaper before I got here, and I thought this was kind of funny to put in there <laughs> when I came to this talk. But then I came here, and I kind of drove around Tampa, where I grew up, and came out here, and it's, it's true, even, <laughs> even at my age. So it's kind of depressing. But I'll try to move forward. And so, so really, what we know about immune systems in, in really great depth, we know a lot of little things and kind of anecdotal things across many phyla. But where we know immune systems in great depth comes almost all from mammals and, and, and a couple of other vertebrates. And then, you know, to, to a large extent, there's, there's, there's a lot known about immunity in Drosophila. And, and pretty much everything else is a blank. So that's, you know, a couple of members of two phyla among about 35 animal phyla. And, and so one thing that's kind of come out of that is this concept that, um, that vertebrates have an adaptive immune system and, and that means a uh, kind of immunoglobulin T cell receptor system or the system that you think about when you think about vaccines and things like that. And invertebrates and vertebrates also have an innate immune system, and that's an immune system which you're, you're born with and, and which is kind of a, a, an evolutionary system for recognizing non-self and, and pathogens. And, and kind of um, informally thought is the idea that vertebrates have this really complex immune system because they're complex and at the top of everything. And invertebrates have a, a simpler kind of immune system. And, and we, of course, don't believe that here, but I'll try to talk about that some. And so immunity uh, as a field has, has kind, of, um, kind of taken on a, a larger sector of biology over the last 10 years or so with the realization that immune systems are, are, are really important for a lot more than just protection. And protection is only one little part of what an immune system does. And, and the, the, a large part of what immune complexity may be doing is mediating interactions with the microbial world that's, that's non-self, which we're all coded in and have inside of us and all that kind of thing. And so that, that kind of makes immunity a, a kind of a more, a more interesting field even than than it was before. And so another kind of idea is that immune systems involve more than just immune cells. So they're not just, it's not just T cells and, and blood cells. It's, it's every tissue in the body. So every tissue has immune properties and can, has receptors that can recognize non-self and signaling molecules that can alert other cells to, to problems. So it's a really a whole organism 
phenomena. So you really want to study it in kind of whole organi organism. And then there's the, uh, this idea that um, if you look across phyla, you find, um, you find many different types of immune systems. As we start to look at genome sequences, we find that, that the kind of mouse type immune system or vertebrate immune system and the fly type of immune system are only two ways that animals probably carry out immunity. And, and so we get hints from looking at, at, at different genomes, genome sequences, and it, and it looks like there's probably all kinds of things going on that but, but we really can't understand them very easily right now. And so there's all kinds of interesting evolutionary questions to look at um, and reasons to look at simple models in invertebrates to tell us about, about things about ourselves and about the human immune system and about how other animals have kind of solved these problems. So that's kind of our point of view uh, in doing this. And, and so, you know, immunology, unlike fields like developmental biology and neurobiology, really hasn't relied as heavily on, on these simple invertebrates um, and complex invertebrates, uh, you know, as much as these other fields. And so just to kind of make the point, even a kind of facultative multicellular animal like um, Dictostilium, which is social amoeba, when it comes together and forms a, a, a multicellular body, it turns out that some of the cells specialize to become phagocytic and, and, and kind of carry out immune properties, uh, immune functions. And so given that, we would think that immunity probably developed early in multicellular life. And I'm talking about immunity in bioteriums, not in other, other clades like, like um, plants and things like that, which have their own very complex immune systems, which, but which are somewhat different from, from the ones I'm talking about. So anyway, immunity is a general property of, of multicellular animals and even single-celled animals. And, and if we look at what we know about immune systems kind of starting from, from humans and going throughout vertebrates, we find that if we look in the jawed vertebrates, all the way from chondrichthyan fishes to, to, to ourselves, um, these animals all have a lot of the things that we think about when we think about, say, human immunity. And, and this is stuff that we work down in, in Gary's lab and that kind of thing. They all have T cell receptors and immunoglobulins, and they all have tissues like spleen and thymus where these things develop. And they use kind of the same mechanisms to, to, um, to create diversity, immune diversity. And, and so, so that's a kind of a jawed vertebrate phenomenon. And so I'm telling you this because I'm going to show you how unexpected things happen kind of recently looking at immune systems even within vertebrates. And so there's differences among vertebrates that are very interesting, but as a whole, they, they, they have the same kind of system in jawed vertebrates. And then if we look at jawless vertebrates, um, Zev Panzer, or if we look at the lamprey, if we start looking at a lamprey as an example, for years it was difficult to understand um, how this immune system worked. And a lot of people in Gary's lab and, and, and other places looked for homologs of a lot of these, these um, immune receptors, and, and, and we weren't able to find them. And, and, and early on, Gary had, had found a kind of specific reactions within these um, within uh, the bodies of these organisms that would suggest some type of adaptive immune system, but, but we could never find homologs that we could find in, say, sharks and things like that. So about 10 years ago or so, Zev Panzer and Max Cooper's lab published a paper where they were looking for homologs of these T cell receptors and immunoglobulins, and Zev instead found this kind of multi-gene family of there's an alignment of a bunch of these different genes and it had this kind of it's called a leucine rich repeat kind of structure and he noticed that there, it was very diverse so it had some similar similar regions but then other regions that were hugely diverse and so that had kind of the signature of a of a kind of immune type receptor molecule and Zev had worked on a lot of large multi-gene families of these that are kind of typical type genes but present in many kind of diverse copies. And he kind of, I think, initially assumed that it was something like that. But then when they looked at the genes that encoded this molecule, they found it was encoded by a single gene. And it turns out there was three versions of it. But one gene was encoding many of these things. And so it looked very much in, in a kind of analogous way to what you see when you look at immunoglobulins and T cell receptors, where somehow a single locus was creating diversity. And it was creating it at a somatic level. So if you looked at the genome of the animal, uh, at the, the genome that wasn't in the, in the lymphocyte-like cells that were creating this diversity, you found kind of one normal gene or one gene. 
And if you looked at these lymphocytes, you found that, that um, the gene had rearranged in some, in some way. And so that's, that's the same thing that you see for T cell receptors and immunoglobulins. And so it turned out later that the story got even more complex because it turned out there were three of these, of these VLR, variable lymphocyte, variable lymphocyte-like receptors. And, and it turned out that the three receptors were expressed on three types of cells. And when, when people in Max Cooper's lab looked at these cells in detail, they started to see that, that the cells really looked a lot like T and B cells that we have. And so T cells carry T cell receptors and B cells carry immunoglobulins. And they're totally unrelated to these receptors. They're not anything like them, but they're, they're somewhat analogous to them in the sense that they create diversity at the somatic level. And so what, what the picture that's starting to appear, and we'll see how, how well it holds out, it'll probably be a little more complex, but is that these, these lampreys have cells that are like these B and T cells that we have, but they, care, they bear receptors, diverse receptors that are entirely unrelated to the cells that our B and T cells carry, or say a mouse does, and yet they have similar properties. So the cell, the machinery that specifies the cell and allows the cell to function predates the diversifying receptor that, that comes on, that, that, that's on its surface. And somehow, one way or another, there was a switch out of these diversifying receptors. And so kind of the important point here is that even though anything that's not a jawed vertebrate doesn't have Ig or T cell receptor genes, um, they, they potentially have some of this um, uh, genetic circuitry that allows these cells to, to be the cells that they are. So where did that circuitry come from? And so that's kind of the question or part of the question that, that, that we look at. And so the idea is that these immune mechanisms, the receptors themselves, are the things that see non-self evolve rapidly. And some of them evolve very rapidly relative to other genes in the animal. And yet at the same time, if you look even across Bioteria or into Drosophila, you can find elements of immune cells. And all these animals in the Bioteria, the animals that have mesoderm, they all have immune um, blood-like cells or phagocytic cells and other things. But it's, it's hard to, to kind of homologize these things together. But if you look across these animals, um, you can find genes that they express that are, that are homologous. And you find hints that there's some deep kind of kernel of, of genetic circuitry there that, that this stuff's building on top of. And so we want to kind of understand that, both for understanding how to use these things for models to understand human aspects of immunity and for understanding how these systems evolve. And so today I'll kind of go into that with stuff from the sea urchin, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we found in the sea urchin genome and how, it, how it, it kind of showed a system that looked different than what you see in fly and also what you see in vertebrate. And I'll tell you what we found looking at the development of sea urchin larval immunocytes uh, with the idea of how are they similar or different to, to vertebrate um, immune cells or blood cells, which are well, or well studied at least in terms of their development and, and, and the genes that control their development. And then I'll talk about how we... Um, are using the larva as kind of a simple model that's easier to work with than the adult for le looking at some aspects of immunity in this animal. So first, the genomic point of view. So the first thing I'm sure you guys know, but usually people don't, is that echinoderms are, even though they don't look anything like us, they're relatively closely related to us among many of the other phyla. So they're deuterostomes. And so they, because of that, they share a lot of, of um, genetic heritage with, with ourselves that you don't find in some of these other groups. And maybe even more importantly, some of the, the important models in these other groups, fruit fly, insects, and nematodes, are kind of long branch animals that, that um, tend to diverge away and lose a lot of genes relative to some of these other things that are in this group, like some of the mollusks and, and annelids. So, so, so we've been looking at the genome of, of the purple sea urchin. And, and then comparing it to other genomes. So Kate Buckley is a postdoc in the lab, and she has a computer that has every genome from everything across this thing that's sequenced. And we've also been involved in about 10 genome projects looking at immune system genes and, and in a way that we can kind of compare across these things. And so she came up with a kind of scheme for kind of sorting through these genomes 
picking out domains that can be of interest um, from an immune point of view and kind of putting them together so that we can kind of settle on things that are immune homologs. And the important thing here is we can only find things that, that have um, that, that are known to o operate in immunity in, 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 say, vertebrates or some of these other animals. And so there's a lot of other things that are probably very interesting that, that at this point we don't really see, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. And so when we looked at the sea urchin genome, we annotated about 1,000 genes or so in the genome of you know, something like 18,000 or 20,000 genes that had immune functions. And so we found things that are innate type recognition receptors that are homologs of some of the things that we have. We found um, uh, kind of genes that mediate immune signals and that kind of thing. We found genes that mediate immune uh, um, effector properties like killing and that, that kind of stuff. We found hom interesting homologs of vertebrate adaptive immune systems even though the searchin doesn't have this type of immune system but some of the genes are still there and it'd be interesting to see what they're doing. And then things like cytokines and signaling molecules and growth factors. And also importantly, we found, um, we found homologs of, of all of the really important hematopoietic transcription factors and kind of transcription factor subfamilies. So vertebrates have more transcription factors than searchin has because they've undergone these genome duplications but we can find kind of orthologs of all of these things in the sea urchin and, and, and a lot of these things you can't find in, in protostome models. And so one of the interesting things we found is that the, adapt, the innate immune system receptors were, were hugely expanded relative to what you see in vertebrates and, and in, in the insects. And so things like these genes called toll-like receptors, which on the outside of them have a structure that looks a lot like those lamprey VLR um, uh, genes, except that they're, they're, they have longer, um, higher number of these leucine-rich repeats, and on the inside have a signal-mediating toll tier domain. Uh, so when we look at the searchin genome, there's 250 of this or so of those things. Now humans have about 10, and searchin has some, I mean, not searchin, Drosophila has, has uh, about nine of these things collectively. And then we found the same thing for some other types of receptors. That, that see non-self and, and the function uh, in the immune function of these animals. And so the important thing here is that the sea urchin had immune receptors of a totally different kind of expansion and flavor than what you see in these, in these other animals. And how they function exactly is, is, is unknown. And so if you look at the toll-like receptors as an example, because they're kind of easy to define and work with, um, you find that there's, there's a number of different families of these things that each kind of diverge from one another some, some long time ago, so we can find families like this also in, in the starfish. And so if you look at them, they have kind of different structures. One's kind of interesting, this one here, there's about three of them in the sea urchin. It's very similar to the one that you see in fly, it has a slightly different structure, and it's, it's orthologous to the one that you see in fly, and it turns out all animals except vertebrates have a toll-like receptor like that. And so vertebrates have lost that type of toll-like receptor for some reason. So it clearly has some kind of important function in, in, in these animals that, that somehow vertebrates got away with. And then we find other ones that are short and things like that. And so one type of analysis that we did, because we can't really define what these things are seeing very easily because they're seeing something in the non-self world and it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem to, to fish that kind of thing out. But you can kind of look at how maybe they're seeing or what part of them is seeing it. And what we did was we used a, a, a kind of a, a technique to computationally look at these sequences. So these are vertebrate, these are human toll-like receptors that recognize um, lipopolysaccharides in, from, from um, bacteria. And they recognize it in concert with another molecule. But if you look at how the residues are evolving within mammals, in, in, this, in this structure here, you can find some that are likely to be under Darwinian selection by the way that they're evolving, that they're changing throughout in these comparisons. And it turns out that the ones that look like that are very close to the areas where these things are known to bind their ligands and also close to the areas where they dimerize because that's, that's part of the regions, that's part of the way they operate. And so if we do the same thing with the sea urchin ones, we find interesting patterns. We see that instead of on the outside where most of the vertebrate ones seem to bind things, it's, it's this inside, these beta sheets on the inside that, are, that seem to be evolving 
um, under selection, and also patches that could be part of dimerization. And then other families show no sign at all of this kind of selection. So the point here is that each of these families seems to be evolving in kind of a different way, and that might be a hint to, to how they're operating. And this one that shows a lot of positive selection, or at least likelihood of it, is a large family very quickly turning over um, genes, and there's lots of pseudogenes, so it's kind of an interesting family. So if you look at it in two different sea urchin species, that toll-like receptor is a very large family, and, and then it's a smaller family in Lytokinus variegatus, which is a sea urchin that lives around here. So this in Strongylus and Trotus, it's larger, and that's another kind of thing that we've seen looking at these multi-gene families, is that some urchins, if, so where we can really look at the orthology, some urchins um, have relatively small families of genes. They're still large by vertebrate standards or insect standards. And, and, and other ones have larger ones. And it turns out that this applies also to other, t other families of molecules. So if we look at some signaling molecules, this one also has small families and this one also has large families. So there's some kind of interesting evolutionary patterns that we don't really know what they mean yet, but, but they might correlate to different aspects of lifespan and lifestyle. So we also see, we see that kind of thing. We see other families where there's just kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. So there's just one in each family member. And we see other ones where they've kind of split apart, where each, each one is in a different clade. So they're all the product of an ancient duplication. So we can start kind of picking apart how these things evolve. And so the, the conclusion is that, that that's an aspect of immunity that's quickly <coughs> evolving. And that's um, the type of thing that, that's at the outside of the immune system. And so what we see is that we see both conservation and variation among aspects of this system.